Leon's campaign is supposed to return to the franchise roots of being survival horror. Unfortunately, Capcom dug up the roots to the wrong tree. Due to the action-oriented design of the game as a whole, these goals are frequently at odds. The general pattern is to have a stretch of calm, or at least calm-er, segments before culminating in one explosive action-packed sequence. It plays the most like 4 and 5 while failing to live up to even the worst moments of either game. Part of this is because Resident Evil 6 doesn't know how to scare the player. This is because survival horror is not only built up of a lack of resources, but also a lack of tools, knowledge, and capability. Imagine if, in The Last of Us, the player did not have the ability to see where enemies were during the stealth segments. It would make creeping around in the dark without a flashlight a lot more frightening instead of just tense. Instead of being clever, Resident Evil 6 tries to scare the players using cheap jump tactics. You can tell which dead bodies are supposed to leap forward and shout BOO! This doesn't force the player to anticipate the scare, it lets them know precisely when it's going to happen. In addition to not being scary, it also insults the player's intelligence. It's only logical to assume a player will instead try to preemptively kill the zombie, once they recognize the trap. But this doesn't work. The zombie is unable to be harmed until the jump scare is triggered, meaning if a player is observant and clever, they are not rewarded. In fact, they are punished or as close as can be. Instead, Resident Evil 6 is just too in love with itself and what it considers to be clever scares. Take, for example, a metal detector that a player is aware, especially if they've played Left 4 Dead, will go off once they pass through it. They can't slide over the desks or step around, and thus are forced by the game to step on through. Known That's the problem, Leon. You did know better, because chances are, the player knew better. This very same logic plays out in a later swimming segment. If a player swims too closely to a corpse, it'll latch onto them, not only dealing damage but also costing them air. The passages are too narrow to effectively dodge these zombies, and as a result, most players will be unable to avoid getting grabbed and may possibly even be forced to repeat the section several times. The opening of the second chapter has great potential to be nerve-wracking as well due to the low light in the cemetery setting. It quickly becomes clear, however, that the enemies are simply infinitely respawning. There is nothing more immersion or tension-breaking than realizing the game is just going to keep tossing enemies at you. Instead of creeping forward, looking in all directions while stricken with paranoia, the player is merely going to run through the section as fast as possible to avoid dealing with as many zombies as they can. The second crutch Resident Evil 6 relies on is to simply scare the player with numbers. There are times I actually think uneven odds can make a game incredibly tense and force a level of resourcefulness from the player. But knocking the player down every chance they can and forcing them through quick time events are simply throwing too much chaos into the mix. Instead of forcing a player to think on their feet, the train of thought is interrupted, forcing them to completely change tracks. It's not about needing to keep track of ammunition or even the terrain, but instead being prepared to waggle some sticks at any moment. It's like someone played the opening village sequence of Resident Evil 4 and thought, Oh! I get it. Lots of enemies is a fun challenge, with no actual thought towards balance or what made that moment so great in the first place. Of course, no Resident Evil is complete without creative new monsters. While Resident Evil 6 has a few good monster and boss fights scattered throughout, barely any of them makes it into Leon's campaign, with the greatest exception being the hunter that follows Jake around. It was a boss fight turned into a puzzle, the most interesting fight in the game up to that point relying on the player to think outside the box. It was nothing too clever, certainly, but being able to do something other than pump ammunition into a foe was a great change of pace. Contrast this with the gassy thing in Chapter 2 and the opening of Chapter 4, who you have to try shooting in the tiny tiny head or else it'll set off a gas explosion. There's no real indication of how well you're doing and how close you're getting to defeat it except a minor response to being shot in the face. And it takes so much ammunition that a player is bound to start trying to figure out alternate fruitless strategies to try and take it out. In fact, it can only be defeated the second time by launching it off the plane. It essentially relies on the other character being grabbed in order to give the player enough time to mash a button to activate the appropriate trigger. Leon's campaign also introduces the invincible regenerating beast worm Thing that, sure, you can temporarily kill, but will still follow you around as you try to navigate a poorly lit maze of an environment looking for special switches. And after you've finally made it through this annoying challenge... Yeah. <laughs> Yet another trap that an observant player can probably see coming miles away, but no option to do anything like shut off the meat grinder. Instead, the player is forced to confront a near-impossible quick-time event. Be prepared to see Leon get chopped up over and over and over, kids. 
You finally confront the big boss of the game, Simmons, as he's transforming into a big, monstrous... thing. Only you have to fight him in so many forms it borders on ridiculous. If you thought the three phases of the final boss were a ludicrous and predictable trope in most games, well, Capcom is here to cheer you up by making you fight the same guy countless times. Perhaps the worst aspect is when you have to fight him in his T-Rex form. His most obvious weak spot is his back, even though it looks as if there should be a weak spot on his stomach as well. In fact, it actually seems as if this is the genius moment when the player is supposed to capitalize on the siding mechanic. Only... not really. Simmons moves too much in too short a span of time and is bound to kick or stomp the player. Instead, it turns out the player is supposed to melee attack Simmons when he's in his human form, even though there is no indication of this and any player worth their salt is going to be trying to fight Simmons from across the room aiming for his back. While there are a variety of other annoying touches and a lot of gameplay that's mildly fun but nothing too incredible, there are some good touches throughout Leon's campaign as well. After finally getting into the castle in Chapter 2, the player is allowed to complete a number of puzzles reminiscent of the earlier games in the series. It gives the player something else to focus on, allowing them to take a bit of a mental break, focusing instead on relaxing problem solving than the intense demands of combat. There's another puzzle in this chapter involving numbered rooms, some of which contain zombies and monsters, others that contain treasures. Figuring out which rooms have which numbers is an interesting little brain teaser, and while the harder puzzles are optional, they offer nice little rewards to the player for choosing correctly. There's also a rather fun, though a bit quick-timey, fight with a monstrous shark beast that's pretty tense and awesome, and is later ruined by a weird swimming segment that, yet again, requires the mashing of buttons. But, hey, at least the fight with Helen and his sister Deborah isn't too bad. Yeah, in fact, it's actually pretty, oh, f*** you. On the whole, however, Leon's campaign is mostly just a slog. It is littered with zombies and obvious traps, infinite respawns, and poor attempts at horror. The gameplay is the least interesting and enough to scare any player off from the remaining campaigns. Before you can even select a campaign to play through, Resident Evil 6 begins Zen Media Res with Leon and Helena. The situation painted is desperate, of a city that's been infected, an injured Helena, what may be a helicopter chasing after our heroes, and big, epic explosions. The point of such an opening is to cause the audience to think, oh man, how did this happen? How did we get here? It then opens at the beginning to answer just those questions. So we open up and... wait, what's going on? How did... why is Helena there? Why, why don't they know each other? How, why are they in the same room? Why is the president a zombie? What's, what's going on? Wait a minute. Did did Capcom open N-Media Res of a story that opens up N-Media Res? And more to the point, this is the third time Leon's had to deal with zombies. And you're going to tell me he still isn't over shooting zombie people? Okay, here's how this scene plays out. Bioorganic weapons are a global threat. Start working with the rest of the world. Iraqi city, Iraqi city, We have cities. to come to me. My desire to reveal the truth. Sure to tell them everything. It might create more problems. That it's time to take responsibility. We want to have any chance. I've always valued your friendship, Leon. Stare at where you are. Mr. President! Here's how our grizzled zombie veteran, Leon, should have handled it. Mr. President! And then he closes with some crappy line like, Guess you won't be getting a second term. Or, I knew I should have voted for the other guy. Or whatever. So for some reason, this school campus has been hit with a T-virus, turning everyone into zombies except for Leon, this Helena character, these guys that get eaten on the TV, and... Oh, uh, no, that's it. Alright, so the first question is, what happened, and where were the uninfected when everyone else got infected? Isn't Leon supposed to be guarding the president? I mean, this is certainly implied later on. I mean, the only real explanation we get later on is that the president is planning on going public with the information about Raccoon City and... Wait, hold, hold on a second. 
Just going to consult the script for the opening of Resident Evil 4 here. 1998, Grizzly murders in the Arclay Mountains, yada yada. Soon after, the news is out to the whole world that it was the fault of a secret viral experiment conducted by the International Pharmaceutical Enterprise Umbrella. Blah blah, not taking any chances, the president ordered a contingency, blah blah. With the whole affair gone public, the blah blah... blah, blah. So... I mean... Ugh. Okay, look. I'm gonna jump the gun here. The basic plot is that the Simmons guy wants to protect America by killing the president and keeping the truth of Raccoon City from going public. Only, according to the opening of Resident Evil 4, it already is public. This isn't a plot hole. This is reaching into the entire franchise's belly button and pulling its guts inside out. You're developing a plot based on something that already happened, which means either this entire game is pointless and we could just call it a fan fiction, or every character in this game is just that stupid or amnesiac. I mean, either way, it's one of these characters never grabbed the colorful bottle in their laundry closet and decided to take a swig. <sighs> so anyway... We start with a dead president and this random woman, Helena, who Leon doesn't know, and yet was also next to the president. In fact, it looks like these two characters got to that room at the same time. So why doesn't Leon know Helena? What is she supposed to reveal at this church she's going to take Leon to? Well, it turns out nothing, because you get to the church and she discovers absolutely nothing herself. In fact, she is just as confused as Leon is when the two of them find a video featuring what seems to be the creepy cocoon birth of Ada Wong, a tape that is never brought up when Leon happens to see Ada. Oh, hey Ada! I just saw the strangest thing about you, but first, let me stare at your ass as we fight some zombies together. I completely trust you despite all the lying you've told me through the past years. And if Helena doesn't know anything about that, then how much does she actually know about the plan? So we discover Helena's sister Deborah beneath the church just as she turns into a cocoon thing herself, and out comes evil Deborah. Turns out this still answers nothing. We get a quick flashback to Simmons having captured Deborah in order to force Helena to help him out. All we get from the game and any additionally unlocked files is that Helena was manipulated by Simmons. This means whatever actually happened at the campus remains unsaid throughout the entire game. But anyway, getting back, Deborah is dead and Simmons is more than fine with framing the death of the president on Leon and Helena, motivating the two characters to get their revenge or whatever. Take a plane to Hong Kong, because that's where Simmons is going to be, only for the plane to be targeted for bioterrorism as well. It seems Simmons figured out what flight they were on anyway, even though they were trying to be all hush-hush about it. They crash in Hong Kong, getting a quick glimpse of Ada on a train, and meet up with Jake Mueller and Sherry Birkin, who has now grown up from her role in Resident Evil 2. Turns out, Simmons is Sherry's boss, but her trust in Leon allows her to question Simmons when they all meet again later. But before that, Leon and Helena run into Ada Wong once more, as well as Chris and Piers, even though she's wearing something completely different than earlier in the game and is speaking in cryptic riddles. In fact, she's wearing something different than when the plane crashed. Even though there's no real reason for Leon to be so trusting of Ada, he allows her to get away. Right after this, Leon and Helena meet back up with Sherry and Jake, and Simmons reveals that in order to protect America from appearing weak, he had to kill the president before he could go public about Raccoon City with information the world already knows because Resident Evil 4 establishes that it is already public and the world already knows. Also, according to bonus materials, Simmons is part of some secret Masons-like organization that has been manipulating the development of the Western world. F***ing people! Why don't you just f***ing start working for Gearbox, why don't you? So, whose body was in your cryotube? That's a longer story. F***ing so Simmons is injected and starts turning into a monster. Leon and Helena chase him down, a big blockbuster fight ensues, and Simmons' own people abandon him. Once he's down, everyone thinks it is time to relax, only for a nuclear biobomb to go off and turn Hong Kong into Raccoon City 2.0. We catch up to where the game begins and media res, and only in nowhere near as desperate a situation and with Helena turning out A-OK. -okay. Ada is in the helicopter helping out, only now she's back in her other outfit, which we'll call Outfit A. If you've guessed where this is going, congratulations, but Resident Evil still wants it to be a mystery. Crash boom bang, explosions, and finally we're left fighting mutant Simmons. Ada helps out more, Leon saves her, Simmons shouts random crap about loving Ada or something, I don't know. And Ada saves Leon. After even more fighting, he finally defeats Simmons and... Oh, clever. Yeah, Simmons and maybe Ada are in cahoots to create some Neo Umbrella. Because what Resident Evil needs is more Umbrella.
Credits roll and we're left with Helena leaving flowers at Deborah's grave. It's time for me to take responsibility. For what I don't know, she helped Simmons, but it is left unclear as to how she did so. They use the fact that it's vague to justify Helena not being arrested, giving everyone a happy ending. Only, Helena tosses Leon an item of Ada's because it's been made damn clear that Leon has an infinite hard-on for Ada Wong, even though she's a cock femme fatale bound to get more kicks out of teasing such a good little Boy Scout rather than give him whatever it is he thinks he wants. So what does Leon's campaign accomplish? Not much. When I first went through the game, I was left with more questions than answers, and not good ones. Instead of being intrigued by the story, I was left confused by everyone's motivations. What's up with good Ada and evil Ada? Why was Hong Kong infected? Why is there a Neo Umbrella in the first place? Why are you making a terrorist organization named after a pharmaceutical company that was also a weapons contractor? More than that, nothing interesting happens with the characters. Leon is left in the same place with Ada as always. He has no clue what side of the conflict she's really on, aside from her own. He knows nothing about her history or motivations. And now his job is left as, well, I guess bodyguard to the next president. Helena, meanwhile, is a complete mystery herself as to why Simmons found her in the first place and why he selected her to perform this mystery task. She had the closest thing to a character arc by facing the death of her sister, but ultimately it was just a revenge story for her. Leon's campaign is left incredibly unsatisfying to play through with clunky gameplay and an even clunkier story. Yet somehow, things actually manage to get better from here on out.